All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. I think we are just about ready to get started whenever Jelana is back with us. Um, so just to talk about our group a little bit, we are the Reuse Project, a collective of students and graduates uh, who create art to make conversation, um, especially about single use items, trash, things that are usually overlooked um, and unconventional for sure within art um, and especially contemporary art. Um, so first, we're going to go ahead and welcome Jelana Byers for um, coming here today and being a part of our talk. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. And we are going to go ahead and give you the mic and you can share your slides whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you so much, Addie. Let me share my screen with you guys. Alrighty, so my name is Jelana Byers. Um, I go by Jelana Ray for my artist name. And before I get started today, I just want to thank Reuse and everybody from the organization for inviting me here. I feel so honored and special to be able to share my story and my truth with you guys. So thank you. I hope everyone's doing well today. And thank you for joining in on a Saturday evening. I know that's not always fun. So um, my name is Jelana, like I said, I'm a model curator. Um, I've been creating art for pretty much my whole entire life. I think it's very important for us to all realize that we're all artists and everything that we do and um, everything in life is art, what is not. Um, when I created, started create, creating art intentionally and from a more thought out and personal space, it comes from a very emotional space. Um, I like to start with what I know, whether that's what's going on in my environment, what's going on in my mental space, what's going on with me emotionally. I think that's a great start for all artists to um, kind of just start with what you know and not try to go outside of that. Um, I try to not have so much fear with addressing the dualities of life, the light and the dark, um, the shadow and what's good and what's bad. I remember taking Professor Tony Allard's class uh, and it's, it's an advanced drawing class at Cal State and he kind of addressed some of those issues and made us realize that there's a balance to that in life and with our artistry and how you can use that and take it and use it for good in your art and not being so afraid or judgmental of what you're feeling or what you're seeing or going through. And so that kind of helps. So when I create art, I intend to address those issues and, and uh, use the power of storytelling for healing for not only myself, but for other people and um, allowing vulnerability to be present because with that I feel like that way a lot of other people can relate and kind of understand you on a more in-depth level. Um, so I create art in two different ways. I'm in front of the lens with modeling and also behind the lens doing photography and directing. So I'm gonna first talk about my experience as a model. I specifically do a lot of print, beauty, and runway work. I started back in 2015, so I've been modeling for roughly around like six years now. And I kind of always wanted to do it just because I've always been a glam girl since I was like little. And I guess me taking the leap of faith with taking pictures and starting this career was really just kind of testing the limits and experimenting with like my own belief and my own perception of self um, and seeing if I could really do it and if I was like beautiful enough to do it. Um, a lot of the pictures earlier on in my career were taken by my really good friend and great photographer, Akeem Brandon. He's from my hometown and we met at a small gathering and he pretty much approached me and asked me if I wanted to take some pictures and do some work with him. 
And I had nothing to lose. So I was kind of just like interested and I trusted in his vision and I wanted to get more comfortable being in front of the lens and interacting with the camera just to see if this is something that I really wanted to do. Um, and it was really fun. I think this is like also some of like my favorite work that I have from my portfolio too, because it just reminds me of the era and the time that I was in, like starting out with trying to embark on this modeling journey and really just trying to not judge and trust myself. And I feel like that rawness is what I kind of like favor so much. So me and Akeem did a lot of work together and I grew my portfolio and more photographers reached out to me. I started booking more gigs. And even though it was a lot of fun, I feel like I early on realized how um, kind of aggressive the industry could be, the fashion and beauty industry um, with just judging women on their body sizes, their shapes, their, their appearance, especially like women of color. I feel like we get judged a little bit more uh, and held to a higher standards in the industry and just life in general. Um, a lot of the times I, I noticed that um, because I wasn't either like a foreign model, uh, like from the UK or uh, Uganda or Nigeria, they wouldn't typically like be interested, just me being African-American. And then also when I had certain hairstyles, I would get, I wouldn't get picked or casted. Um, and so that just was interesting to me. And then it wasn't just in the fashion industry. I began to realize it in um, the normal workplace as well. So in 2018, I, uh, I was a cocktail server at a casino. And that was the first time an employer ever pulled me aside and kind of uh, told me that my hairstyle wasn't professional or didn't fit with their company standards. And I had my hair in braids and I never, it's a protective style for me and a lot of other black women. Um, and I never experienced anything like that. And I kind of remember the emotion and like what I felt going through that. And it kind of um, just made me want to explore why that wasn't okay. Why did we think this way? Why is my normal or what comes natural to me not accepted? Growing up, um, I was inspired by, there wasn't much representation on the screen. Um, for women of color or people that looked like me in general. I remember Naomi Campbell being a really, really big inspiration for me, but um, I also had other monumental moments in, in the media. Um, for example, I absolutely loved the movie, The Wizard of Oz. Could, I would watch it over and over on VHS, would literally do the whole choreography for the Munchkin segment of the movie, I knew all the songs. And then my dad introduced The Wiz to me, which is same storyline, but just in black. And you have Diana Ross, you have Michael Jackson playing the scarecrow. So it was just a completely different experience for me. And it changed my, it changed my life. And because seeing that, seeing someone who looked like me on the screen kind of um, was inspiring and kind of changing. Also um, going to watch Alvin Ailey Dance Company in high school live for the first time. I didn't even know that they, um, uh, African-American dance theater ballet company existed until I had that experience. And it was life-changing to see these black bodies move in the way that they do and to dance to these 
um, very black gospel songs. And just the whole set design was, it was life-changing and crazy for me. And I think that was another moment where I was just like, representation matters. And how do we continue to push these stories and continue to cast people who look like me or other African-American young girls? And boys. Spike Lee, of course, is um, an amazing film director that I feel uh, gives, gives us insight on the Black identity and telling Black stories um, that we can relate to as far as your environment and some of the things that we go through in the day-to-day -day life. So, sorry. <laughs> With my career, I kind of wanted to make an appoint to be um, that example and inspiration for other people, and making sure I created my the body of work that I was doing to. Um, inspire others really and um i feel like i also had to work twice as hard than my peers because sometimes i would have to come to set with my makeup and my hair already done um because they just didn't know how to work with my skin complexion or my hair type and um I remember like sitting down in a hairstylist chair and I would have like two to three people trying to figure out and problem solve. And it was just kind of frustrating for me because it's, it only takes a simple, you learning how to work with other textures other than straight hair, rather than choosing to be almost like ignorant, I feel like, and not learn and not take that opportunity to learn more about something other than what you know or what what um, you're used to. And so that, um, that kind of started my journey and interest in exploring what identity is and um, Identity is defined by who or what a thing is, and it's the human desire to understand and from understand things and what they are. And from that, we begin to place labels and weigh out and place value on things. And we do that in our relationships, career, um, our finances, and our appearance. And specifically, cultural identity is what I think that I was struggling with when having all these experiences in the industry and in the workplace and just people in general, when they see um, me, when I have particular hairstyles or I'm wearing something, I feel I was like labeled. And so cultural identity is defined as the definition of groups or individuals by themselves or others in terms of cultural or subcultural categories, including ethnicity, nationality, language, religion, and gender. And there's a whole other labels under that umbrella of it. So like, where do we learn this from? What does it look like when looking in the, the social lens at the black identity? And how do we shift this perspective? So we get a lot of our influence, obviously, from the media, from the movies we watch, um, what narratives are we hearing from television shows? Is there um, representation in like black cartoons for children? In the news, um, I remember last year during uh, 
a lot of police brutality reports, I had to completely shut the news and social media down because it was almost oppressive than it was informing. How many stories are we hearing where Black kids or people are not getting killed? Are we hearing more of the bad reports or of the good reports? So I feel like it's pushing a certain narrative to continue to make people feel oppressed in the world. And then, our, and then of course, like the magazine and advertisement and music. In 2018, I began doing photography and directing um, the Black Hair series, which is something I wanted to create for Black women to uplift them and remind them of their beauty and just being more comfortable with whatever they choose for their hairstyle, whether it's your natural hair or if you wanted to wear extensions or braids, whatever you felt like you wanted to do, that was okay. And it doesn't mean that you are a certain type of person or you have a certain type of attitude. It's just, it's just you. And I wanted to break that stigma for not only black women to realize, but just people in general that these are humans and labeling someone based off the off of their appearance is, is not fair. And I think there's this is something that we also struggle with within our own community with colorism and judging each other so harshly um, because based off of certain textures that we have, um, there's no such thing as bad or nappy hair. All black women have curly hair and no curl pattern is better than the other. So in creating this photo book, and docu-series, I wanted to remind them of their, the diversity that we bring as Black women, because there's so many different shades and types and textures that we offer. And I don't think that's really praised or honor, honored enough. This was also a learning experience for me too, especially with the documentary, because I had no prior um, experience doing film and or just video at all. And I think video is so much differently than than photography is. So when trying to do the the documentary, I definitely had a lot of trial and error, and I, that goes with creating art as well though too and you can't like really judge yourself for the mistakes that you make and I have to constantly remind myself that's kind of like what I I try to like stand for is um, finding the beauty and in the ugly or mistake making or things that you're not so comfortable with um so it definitely was a, a learning process and it took a village to do. And I'm grateful for all the helping hands that kind of like helped me put this, this um, project together. And these are just some more of the pictures that I took. I have a question out of curiosity. Yeah. Um, so your friend or your subjects for your images, did you say they were friends um, or people you got inspiration from? Like, how did that work out for you as well? So some of them were friends, but I also posted casting, a casting uh, for models to come. But I didn't want like your typical, like your model, I wanted very, I wanted to be very natural and organic and like almost lifestyle. So um, 
because I want it, it to be represented representation of like real normal like woman mm -hmm. and um I also had a hairstylist come in a makeup artist and um it was really fun and I think that it takes a village to get things done as well and and this project um is definitely an example of the power of collaboration, which is really, really necessary when you're creating art. You can't do it alone. I was trying to produce, write, film, edit, and I had no knowledge. And I just wish I had more people kind of to work with and collaborate with on this because it, it, it was a great, it's a great idea and it's still, it's still in the works of being finalized but um yeah I don't know if that answered your question it totally did and it's beautiful yeah I love your work thank you yeah. and so just going back to modeling I wanted to kind of make a vow to myself to stay true to who I am and always um how can you be bold and expressive and tell your truth with like my hair and my appearance. And so a little black girl could one day like maybe see my pictures and be inspired or motivated and feel beautiful as well because someone looks like her. Um, And I thought it was really important and honestly shocking for me because I had previously experienced so much bad when it came to um, my braids and having certain hairstyles. So for British Vogue to feature me and their on their website with me and rocking my cornrows it was just kind of like it spoke volume to me and I hope it does to other people when they see this and to um by saying that you could you could rock your hairstyle it's it's beautiful still um and I remember even for this shoot I kind of messaged the, the handbag designer and I was like I have braids in right now is that okay and she's like, no, your hair looks completely fine. And so this was kind of really inspiring for me to say the least. Um, yeah. So all in all, my main goal to relate to anyone watching this today was really to just believe in yourself and just have courage and be comfortable. I made a little acronym for the, the word black. So I'm gonna read that off to you guys. So B stands for beauty standards and it's societal standards. Um, control your standard, don't let the standard control you. There is beauty in your individuality and L stands for love, love yourself and one another. And remember that love is the highest frequency. When, when you fear, when you feel fear, it's the absence of love and a blockage of love. Um, love your art and your beauty and your history, where you come from. Accept yourself and others and the differences between yourself and others. Um, have courage and being you, the real raw and uncut you, telling your story. I had to muster up a lot of courage to just shoot this PowerPoint today. And I think a lot of the people who are close to me can tell you that, um, cause I've been freaking out about it all week. <laughs> and have courage in believing in yourself and your own, in your in individuality and uniqueness. Um, K stands for knowledge. 
uh, which is choosing growth. When you choose to learn, you choose to grow and expand yourself. Uh, knowledge and knowing yourself and where you come from and what your ancestors did to bring you here today. And that's pretty much all I have. Thank you guys so much again for listening. Thank you, Addie and everyone else from Reuse for allowing me to speak today and share my truth. Absolutely. We love having you so much. Let's see. It looks like there's something Oh, in the chat. Nicole said, when you choose to learn, you choose to grow. I love that. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so now we will actually open up for a little Q&A if anyone has questions for Jelana um, about anything that she just went through and investigated with everyone. Um, if you want to, feel free to put it in the chat, of course, um, or just speak out, whatever you're comfortable with, definitely. Hi, um, this is actually not Samuel. My name is Kelly Davis. Hi, Addie. Hi, Daisy. <laughs> Hello. Oh. <laughs> uh, hello, hello, hello. I wanted to first, Jelana, thank you so much for that beautiful, beautiful journey and for your courage and for you putting yourself out there. This is what the world needs. We just, just thank you for that, that social courage. So thank you, first of all. And uh, what I wanted to ask with your own work, your own photography work, there was this kind of like your models were looking away and it's kind of cool, like there were things in the way between the model and the such and some things were a little blurry. Was that intentional? Uh, and if so, why? And if not, did you see that? Hi, yes, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for those beautiful words. Um, some of it was intentional, some of it I think when you're kind of shooting you just things happen and you're like oh that's cool or it kind of just like works in a way where the camera almost brings out or the camera brings out the beauty or like elements in your environment kind of like help what you're trying to portray and I kind of just like I don't really do too much telling the model how to pose or what to do I kind of just let them groove and let them um, do whatever comes naturally to them. Oh, she gave you a part. Awesome, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. And I guess last question, sort of as a, a fellow black woman and our hair, uh, I wanna say, uh, and Dinah knows me, I'd like to offer any support because I heard what you said you have these amazing ideas and the fullness and, and the daunting of having to put that out and produce it. I heard you and I'm here for you if you do need some assistance. And the standard of beauty that exists out here, as much as we've been talking about white supremacy, one of the things I have noticed that comes with that is the impact it has had on being in a uh, basically a white patriarchal society and their vision of what beauty is. I'm of the generation that I used to go around and go in the stores like, where are the black mannequins? I, you know, and, and the hairstyles. And I just wanna say that thank you for, for exploring that. And I find that I have been with black women that have said to me, because I wear my hair naturally at this time, that they appreciate my courage. Do you hear that? That it's courageous for me to go around with my natural hair. Could you also, again, speak a little bit about your journey with that? You touched on it a little bit. Yeah, um, my hair is, we're still, we're dating and we're still getting to know each other. But I realized that I would, growing up, I didn't really know how to take care of what naturally came to me. Um, because I was so bent on just having it straight and keeping it straight because that's how my mom would style my hair. I wasn't until my freshman and sophomore year of college, I really um, had to learn how to take care of my hair and wanted to kind of like wear it naturally. And by that time it was, 
it was kind of damaged from all of the lack of love that I gave, I didn't previously give it um, beforehand. Um, I had been so spoiled when I was with my parents because my mom had me in the hair salon every two weeks getting my hair done. And I couldn't afford that when I was in college. So it was like, girl, you're gonna have to teach yourself how to do your own hair. <laughs> um, and I think with this journey, I realized um, it's a lot like tending to a plant. You have to give it a lot of care, a lot of love. I speak to my hair. I give, I tell it positive affirmations. Um, I let go of the dead ends that no longer serve me. And I just try to be more patient and gentle with it. Um, and it's a process, it's a working process. Um, I still haven't worn my curls and my fro out yet in public. Sometimes I'll wear my hair, but a majority of the time it's, it's in a bun or in a completely different style or in braids because it's protective and easy and I just like to get up and go. But yeah, it's a process and journey that I'm still embarking on. And thank you so much for those words of encouragement. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and Jelana, I can give you Kelly's information, definitely, if you ever want it in the future, too. Kelly is amazing. Uh, yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you, Kelly, for coming and everything. Um, also, I saw in the chat, Nancy asked a question for you, Jelana. She said, were your parents helpful in sharing their lives so that you felt inner strength through them? Anything you feel that you can share with the participants, maybe about your family? If you're comfortable, of course. Mm, that's a good question. I feel like I know my parents, but I don't really know them. <laughs> like, I feel like that's some, there's a part of them that they're kind of like still maybe like learning. I know a little bit about like, of course, like the heritage as far as like grandparents and great grandparents go but on both sides of my parents. Um, and that me and my mom, we talk about her journey as a young and her younger like woman days and like some of the things that she had to go through and endure. But I think now me trying to um, address some of the insecurities that I have when it came to like my beauty standards, especially with my hair, I feel like I inspire my mom to also follow in the journey with me because now she wants to wear her natural hair all the time which is cool, but I also became her hairstylist during the process. So I'm trying to figure my hair out while also figuring her hair out. And it's, it's fun and we get to, um, it's a bonding, um, it's a bonding um, experience with both of us, I guess. So it's cool. But th I think that's the only thing that comes to mind Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. I just saw Dinah raised her hand. Um, if you wanted to speak up, Dinah, or put it in the chat, of course. Oh, no. Hi. Um, thank you for participating. I mean, thank you for, um, for this conversation today. I feel like it's very important for people to understand how like Black hair is art. It is form and texture. It's emotions. Um, this is a, you know, I know that California and New York had a, uh, a a state they passed a state law for to stop laws that stop discriminating against natural hair and it's so interesting that we have to ha create legislation to tell people to stop being assholes to us because of our hair and it's so important for us to normalize having hair that doesn't move <laughs> because there's this idea that hair moving is freedom <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering with the fashion industry and with photography, like how, how are you, you know, entering these conversations with those who like call our hairstyles like ghetto or hood or urban, you know, and I'm wondering like what languages are you hearing on set, you know, that are very alarming to like there's a misunderstanding and undervalue of black hair. Yeah, so the Crown Act um, 
it was actually passed in 2018. And I think the first state that passed it was California and then New York followed. And, I, and there's a few other states that have passed the bill too. But it's, it's almost wild to think that this, like during this time right now, we're still, we still have so much progression to go with um, stereotyping and identity, especially with the black identity. Um, but with the fashion industry, they, I feel sometimes when a black woman does certain things, for instance, like um, we see baby hairs on the runway now or mm -hmm. uh, do rags, which is particularly things that come from a black culture, but um, you put it in a Marc Jacobs runway show and now it's high fashion. So how, why are we taking um, the inspiration from black culture and only labeling it ugly or ghetto or um, whatever craziness you wanna call it when it's on that, but if it's on a white body, if it's on Kylie Jenner, then it's, um, it's high fashion, it's beautiful. And it's a, a new trend. Um, I remember when Kim Kardashian came out with her boxer braids. It was, it's just like, this is something that's been done way, way before our time. And now that Kim Kardashian has it, it's, it's kind of a trend how they take things from black culture and make it trendy. Um, but as far as me working in the fashion industry and what I do when I have, um, I feel comfortable with coming with my different hairstyles. I don't try to uh, fit the standard of what I think that they wanna see. I come as I am and if you like it, then you do. And if you don't, then we shouldn't be working together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I hope that answered your question. Thank you. No problem, thank you. Awesome. And I see Margaret uh, said also, thank you so much for sharing your experience and your art. Um, she said, I really resonate with, with expressing both light and darkness through art and not being judgmental of where you are in your practice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Margaret. You guys are also so sweet. You're such an inspiration. I'm so happy we got you here. <laughs> oh, awesome. Okay, so for maybe like 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, we're going to look through um, some artists of inspiration that have themes that resonate along with Jelana's. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen and let me know if y'all can see it. Right, let's see. Not share, we want to present. Okay, are we all good? Yes. Okay, beautiful. Okay, I'm going to talk first, just for a second, about Tatiana Fazliada. I'm terrible at pronouncing names, but um, she is a beautiful, influential um, artist. Let's see, where are we? So she was born October 12th of 1985. Um, she is a Black and Iranian visual artist. Her work brings awareness to represent marginalized communities of color and the daily oppressions faced, such as street harassment in particular towards women. So her work ranges from street art to gallery spaces, making it very accessible to the public. Um, and she's also lectured at museums and universities like the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, the Brooklyn Museum, New Orleans Contemporary Art Center, and universities like I had mentioned before. Um, and all of this information is from her website, which has so much great information and um, photography of her work. So I'm not sure if anyone has heard of this series that she did, but it's called Stop Telling Women to Smile. So it's addressing street harassment in public spaces, um, bringing attention and especially to people who identify as women. Um, so this series, it consists of hand-drawn portraits that she did um, of women. And she talked with them firsthand about their experiences and then composed their portraits and turned them into posters and added text that they had mentioned during their interview. Um, so you can find these portrait posters all around Brooklyn, New York, and around the nation, um, bringing awareness and especially a sense of storytelling, which is very inspiring. And here I just have a couple of images as well. 
And I remember Jelana and I took a course together where we actually learned about Tatiana and about art and social change. So this is really cool how everything always comes around together. Let's see if I can get this on the side. There we go. So there's another one. All right, and so next we are gonna go ahead and segue over to Olivia whenever you're ready. All right, so um, I kind of want to look into um, modeling just because that's kind of um, an area I don't really know that much about. And um, in looking at uh, different uh, historical events with modeling, um, I found out about uh, Beverly Johnson, which um, she was the first African-American model to be ever shown on the cover of Vogue. Um, 1974 and um, she has continued her work. I think the image on the bottom right is one of her more recent photos. Um, with, uh, with her historical um, groundbreaking of being the first African-American model on Vogue, she has really used that to advocate for other people, which I find really cool that now that she has kind of this place um, within the modeling industry that she's really pushing to try to support other people and get more people into the industry. And that's not just models either. Um, she talks about how you, in behind the scenes, like people will take photographs, costume designers, makeup artists, and even in the higher up like management roles, you don't really see a lot of diversity, which um, she really wants to get more people into those roles because it's not just about in the fashion industry from what I understand it's not just about the people who uh, you take photos of it's like the whole set like every single person involved um, if you want to go to the next slide I have a quote from her that I feel like encapsulates it so uh, she says year after year companies inflict harm against black culture while actively gouging it for inspiration and taking all of the profit which is definitely a big issue, which I feel, even though I don't know that much about fashion, I, I do know like in the background, like that's what I've heard from it. That's like an out, from like an outsider experience that they kind of just like act like vultures and pick things out and then don't even like credit anyone or say like, oh, you're inspired by someone. So they kind of just take it and use it and don't get, give anyone the proper credit. So I just thought, she is really cool for like trying to like say, you know, hey, that's not okay. We need to fix this and um, seeing how she's going about doing that. Awesome. All righty, and then moving on to Fenty Beauty and, and Rihanna. All right, so um, this is Robin Fenty, uh, mostly known as Rihanna. Um, she is a singer, actress, and businesswoman who was born and raised um, in Barbados. She uh, gained recognition in 2005 for her musical talents, and so like since then, she's won multiple Grammys and a lot of other awards for her music. Um, she's an advocate for women's rights, LGBT rights, and um, racial equality as well. Um, she noticed how there wasn't as much representation for people of color in the media, um, notably fashion and makeup. And um, many makeup companies really catered to people with lighter skin and often didn't really make products particularly for people who have darker complexions and like different undertones. Um, so in 2017, she created Fenty Beauty. Um, she was praised for by consumers for having like such a large range of skin tones in her foundation and concealer con collection. And then just go ahead and get to the, the next slide. Yes. Um, she also made sure to feature um, many black models and other people of color in her um, marketing campaign, which include um, Ducky Thought on the left and Slick Woods on the right. Um, she includes people of all genders as well in her website, um, and she does a great job representing people who have not really been represented in the fashion and makeup industry um, in her products and business. Thank you so much. 
All righty, moving right along. Yeah, so next is Chindimba Noli. Um, she is a 22-year-old Nigerian artist who has a bachelor's in fine and applied arts from the University of Benin, Nigeria, and works with oils as her primary medium. She challenges stereotype psychology and the cultural conditioning of women while exploring elements of identities, sexuality, sexuality, and mental health. Next right. slide, please. Um, so here we see one of her works. Um, I think the color that we mostly see is very, that she emphasizes in her work is the color black. Um, she draws from her experiences growing a patriarchal Catholic home. And she states that it felt very stifling and ex and and I existed in an environmental environment of anxiety and fear where I felt uneasy to relax is what she stated. Her oil-based artworks are mostly focused on like these ethereal, ethereal and subver submersive um, and centering on somber, somber, unsmiling women of their hazy environments and rendered in pastels. So um, I just want to point out, I think this brings back these, this brings back the idea of like your history and past experiences and your upbringing as a black person. Um, she wa she wants to emphasize how that affected her her life and her views, and wants to showcase that in her through her art. Next slide. Yeah, please. Okay, Sorry. Cool. No, you're good. <laughs> Um, so her current style of art is, is inspired by Impressionism and Renaissance art. So she focuses on texture and brush strokes and palette, um, using the palette knife with those um, large um, blotches of paint to create these like hazy environments. Um, and so she also states that she partic particularly loves the way Renaissance, Renaissance figures are passed in I use black bodies because of the color of my skin. It portrays my existence and experiences properly. Um, th that's why she uses that prominent black color in her paintings. And she also mentions that her upbringing influenced her art and is a huge, um, and is a huge part of her work that is based on conditioning. So um, she wants to question that cycle of black culture and question society societal structures of how it affects her lives um, or just like the black community in general and how we behave. Awesome, thank you so much. Alrighty, we are all back together. Um, yeah, thank you all of our reuse team members for um, doing that as well and having a moment to talk about other artists um, to kind of envelope the whole talk. Um, so now we have like eight minutes to kind of hang out and talk a little bit more about maybe some of the other artists, or we could talk a little bit more about Jelana and her experience. Uh, the floor is definitely open right now. Um, I also see in the chat, um, thank you for your bravery to Jelana and straightforward approach to the creative process. Awesome. I just wanted to point out how I liked how Jolana mentioned how when she went in with her braids or before going in, she like um, warned the photographer like, hey, or the stylist, like, hey, I'm going to be coming in with braids. Is this OK? And I think it's it like emphasizes on this important like role photographers and art directors have, like especially like white art directors who like they need to it's important for them to accept this like different this is embracement of different like identities and like how people choose to present themselves they have to, i think it's um they have to not accept because it's like I, I don't know if that's the right word but um allow this um identity to be showcased in various ways because that's the way like I mean, media is obviously seen everywhere, like magazines, news. And um, I think it's beautiful that, that the art director actually was like, yeah, that's fine. Like, go for it. Like, and it ended up being um, published in like the British Vogue. So that's amazing. No, absolutely. Because so for instance, like my agent, uh, she'll send a casting and she'll, She's like, how's your hair right now? And I'm like, oh, I have braids. And she's like, 
freaking out like go get a wig girl like you can't submit to this casting with braids in. and so I think that kind of like made me just a little more aware of like do people want my hair to look like this and that's why I felt like I needed to message the designer and say hey like just heads up like this is what my hair is and I'm not changing it so <laughs> if you want to cast me this is what you're going to be working with and that was another full circle moment for me to say like yeah you you can do this you're a beautiful talented model and um your braids are or that's art too and look it, you made it in vogue <laughs> What blows my mind is that oh, everyone so thinks that the, sorry. <laughs> um, what blows my mind is that everyone thinks art is immune to racism because it's all beautiful and creative things, but I want the audience to understand like the same institutionalized and like white supremacy exists in all industries and the director, the curator, the art institution controls the message and they control the message of beauty. And this is another example of like how petty racism is, right? Like it's not always like so bold, like you see in civil rights and all that stuff. It can be simply like someone looking at your hair saying, I don't wanna hire her because her hair is natural and that's unprofessional. You know, the fact that we have all these like gold posts, like moving descriptions of what we're supposed to like present ourselves as is very frustrating as a black woman. You know, like the way we have to enter the space. We, you know, those who accept us as our natural being are our allies, but at the same time, like why aren't we allowed to be in spaces as our natural selves at, at all times? Why can't others just accept the fact that some hair doesn't move? The same way your hair moves, my hair doesn't move. The same way you wake up in the morning and your hair falls on your back and you get to get dressed and leave and go out the door should be the, I should have the same right to that too. I don't care if it's lopsided sometimes. That's natural. That's how it flows. And for some reason, we've been told that the way our hair flow is unnatural. And at the end of the day, like we have to understand that racism applies to institutions of art. They really do. And as soon as we can acknowledge that, we can understand how to like go, you know, how to work around it or how to create new institutions for us where we can be in our spaces as our natural self. This is so important why equity and education in art schools is important. We need more black teachers teaching art. You know, we need more black teachers, not only teaching art, but we also need black teachers encouraging artists to be their natural, black artists to be their natural selves. So, I mean, as a black woman, I understand you and I see you and I believe that I believe that you're intelligent and you are beautiful as your natural self. And so thank you for sharing this conversation with strangers, because I feel the best part about art is you you guys can convey these like simple messages through your work and you can build this story with empathy and personal experiences so that people can learn. So I'm very grateful for this experience. And it's very important, important for people to understand, like, there's racism in the art industry. There's inequalities in the, in the art industry. Like, no one's immune to this. It's universal. Racism is universal. So thank you very much. Thank you. you Y'all gonna have me crying on here. My little, that was so beautiful and so true. And I think the time that we're in right now with everything that's going on at the um, in our society, it's it's kind of like a, a, a conscious awakening collectively for us all. And we're kind mm -hmm. of addressing some hard truths with um, racism and where, how much more we still have to go. We've made a lot of progression, but um, there's, there's a lot more room for more. And um, I just hope, and it's not easy or comfortable talking about something that's so um, triggering or hurtful, or especially in rooms where not a lot of people can 
probably understand because they never experienced anything like it. Um, so just thank you guys so much for listening again. I appreciate it. This is my first time doing anything like this, being vulnerable with you. And even though it feels uncomfortable sometimes, I'm gonna choose it every time because um, that that leads to growth and expansion and it's real. It's not sugar-coated. <laughs> so yeah, thank you guys. Also like the black hair industry is a billion dollar industry. Right. So like put respect on us. Like we're worth billions of dollars. Our hair is worth billions of dollars. Like respect us, you know, recognize our beauty, but recognize our economic value to society. So this is this is a conversation that needs to be normalized. And I'm very grateful that we're having this conversation in this space because, you know, there's a reason why Solange made a song, Don't Touch My Hair. Right, so I think this is a this is a great um, way to like introduce people to this conversation and and look at our differences and acknowledge it and embrace them and accept them for what they are, and just treat people like they're normal. You know, it's I just keep thinking of all the times when I was a kid and someone always touched my hair like it was a science project, not ever wanting to touch their hair. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Or even um, me stepping into class and or work and everyone's like, your hair's different. You changed your hair. It's, it's new. It's different. It's not how you usually have it. And it just causes <laughs> so much conversation and commotion sometimes. And sometimes I just don't want that. Sometimes it's just like, I just want to do my work. I just want to come. I don't, I'm not talking about your hair or what you're wearing today. Like, why is this such a target? Mm hmm. Well, thank you again so much, Jelana. Um, we're definitely honored to have you here, especially for this amount of time and to investigate everything and talk together. So just a big thank you from Reuse and Hill Street. Thank you for everything you're doing and Dinah, Margaret, Astrid, everyone, you're amazing. Um, this wouldn't happen without you. So just big love, appreciate you all. Appreciate you. <laughs> Such a good listener. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I see everyone saying thank you. Beautiful. Oh. Well, I hope you all have a wonderful day. And Jelana, I'm so happy this was your first one and that we could be a part of that. It's so special. So thank you. Thank you guys. Yes. Thank you guys. Have a great weekend. Bye.